Welcome to Sacred Heart University's Center for Catholic Studies speaker series. The Center for Catholic Studies promotes innovative and cutting edge programs that demonstrate Sacred Heart University's mission rooted in the Catholic intellectual tradition as a living reality related to our lives and in the world in which we live. Join us now live from the campus of Sacred Heart University with our host, Dr. Brent Little. Good evening and welcome to the Center for Catholic Studies Speaker Series and Human Journey uh, Colloquia. I am Professor Little and I will be your host today. Sacred Heart University's Center for Catholic Studies presents cutting edge programs to demonstrate Sacred Heart University's mission rooted in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Our series this spring features nationally and internationally renowned speakers who will focus on issues of social, racial, and environmental justice. For our program tonight, I am honored to present Nancy Dallavalli. Dr. Dallavalli is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Fairfield University with a PhD in Theology from the University of Notre Dame. Her scholarship focuses on the meeting of feminist thought and Catholic systematic theology, rooted in the study of the Trinitarian God in the work of Karl Rahner S.J. She has published several books chapters as well as articles in scholarly journals. She has served on the editorial board for the theological journal Horizons and the steering committee committees for the Karl Rahner Society in the Trinity Interest Group at the Catholic Theological Society of America. She is currently chair of the advisory board for Liturgical Press. After serving in a variety of mission-centered roles at Fairfield, Nancy has recently turned to teaching full-time. She looks forward to offering a new course on Catholic practice across the span of adult life at two Fairfield studies in fall 2021, titled Catholic 2.0. But tonight, we are honored to have her speak on the topic of gender identity, gender equality, sexual orientation, and Catholic thought. Dr. Delavalli, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Professor Little. I'm happy to be here with you tonight, and I'm grateful to be speaking to the Sacred Heart students who are here as part of their reflection on the human journey. I also have to send a shout out to my uh, students from Fairfield University. University, you're in my Catholic gender class. We have a wonderful time in that class, and I'm hoping that we can continue this conversation when we get back in the classroom together. I think we are at an important moment for Catholic Christianity. The current impasse about sex and gender speaks to a turning point for the church. It is not simply a question of whether the church will change its mind on the rules. In fact, this goes much deeper. We, all of us as church, need to think about what is valued by our faith tradition how it is shaped by revelation, what the project of human knowing has told us, and how we can respond to all of this in a way that is resonant with the deepest vision of Catholic Christianity. Pope Francis's own words and actions illustrate his desire for the church to stand with the current human project in all its lights and shadows. To do this, he has set outreach and solidarity at the top of his agenda, positioning the church as a faithful companion that does not shrink from the griefs and anxieties of our age. He has been willing, personally and as Pope, to wash the feet of this world. But his own words and actions also illustrate the profound inability of the church as an institution to place its sacramental and spiritual riches in serene confidence in service of humanity. Just as one hand reaches forward in welcome, the other pushes those seeking refuge away. What is a Catholic to think? On the one hand, we hear the repetition of long held norms about marriage and sexual morality by the Catholic magisterium. Their language seems to be missing the sense among the people that the human project rightly lived is more complex and various than the image advanced by these norms. An image in which there is a pretty straight linear mapping of creation texts onto the model of God as triune, onto the model of sacramental action, and onto a model of marriage that is lived by a decreasing number of the world's families. On the other hand, ac academics and cultural critics are offering an analysis of sex and gender that claims that these are nothing more than human constructs, and that any norms for the human project that adds any specific content to the terms male and female are problematic and worthy of condemnation. In our time together tonight, I'm proposing that we shift our perspective when considering these issues. Instead, 
I am going to hold up the Catholic understanding of the human person that claims that biological sex is not a mere construct while also claiming that we have no access to this outside of our socialization. And I am going to argue that it further matters that while persons may live a variety of gender identities and orientations, each person that exists, exists in the first place only as the product of male-female sexual union of some kind. In my earlier work, I have posed the first claim, suggesting the term critical essentialism as a way of thinking about sex and gender. What I am putting forward now is an extension of that, suggesting that the importance of male-female sexual union is best understood, is best positioned, not as a projection or an ideal symbol that should drive moral norms, but as the de facto basis for reproduction, generative in the most basic sense of producing generations. Thus I will, with the Dutch theologian Edvard Skilabex, refer to this as an anthropological constant. Overall, what I would like to consider is a shift away from thinking about the church as first and foremost a, as a border guard for moral norms for the card-carrying faithful and toward thinking about the church as the site of the sacramental presence of God accompanying humanity through history. In that accompaniment, the church both proposes and receives reflection on the human person. I offer these two suggestions as a way to facilitate that conversation. But let's begin on the same page. We recall that sex refers to our biological differences as male and female, and gender refers to the social narratives that we have constructed on the basis of that difference. Sex refers to my body's physical and chemical components that lead to a classification as female. I identify as female. Gender refers to the narrative I have absorbed from culture about what it means to have a female body. For example, what my acceptable range of emotion is how I should move through space and how I should exercise agency. We now also use the term intersectionality to name the complexity of that socialized narrative, recognizing that gender difference is not separable from other social markers. Our understanding of ourselves as male or female, as intersex or non-binary is inescapably bound up with other identifying factors. With other physical differences, for example, we may identify ourselves as differently abled or neurodivergent. We may be among the deaf or visually impaired communities. We may identify ourselves as members of a racial or ethnic group or a mixture of these. Even geography matters. We may have a sense of ourselves as a child of a particular corner of the world from this valley, this school system, or the beating heart of this urban center. Immigration too offers a powerful sense of dual place. Home may have two nests or seem forever elusive. Teaching on the East Coast, I find that my students will identify with their area code or highway exit. That area code or highway exit is not mere geography. It is also a marker of social class. The narrative about class, wealthy or middle class or working poor, is also inseparable from other identity markers, shaping the very way we walk on stage. We need to recognize these markers as dynamically shaping our religious affiliations as well. Our sense of ourselves as bound to a religion or other view often comes packaged with our racial or ethnic group in a dance with our family of origin. It is impossible to parse completely the difference between religion and culture. Indeed, for some Catholics, Parish belonging is first and foremost about family, place, class, and culture. Notice I didn't use the word God. Interviewing ninth grade candidates just before confirmation at my local parish, I found that their immediate motivation for this sacrament was a legal threat. They had been told they could not marry in the church without being confirmed. There was also a social threat. Mom had already ordered their sheet cake. I repeat family, place, class, and culture. Our sense of embodied gender bubbles through all of that. One is not simply a child of Scranton. One is a girl from or a boy from. We come of age with possibilities and expectations shaped by social constructs about masculinity and femininity. These possibilities and expectations shape one another in ways that often stress the ways in which they are binary, constructing them in a way that is complementary a zero-sum game in which I become more female the more I shun male attributes, and those whose gender is viewed as non-binary are seen as liminal. 
While yes, some aspects of that binary are linked to biological difference, even these are culturally inflected. We recreate and reinscribe a totalizing gendered edifice on top of our biological differences and call this normal. Let me be clear. I swim in this culture too. We all do. And yes, the broad strokes of this gender binary can be enlivening. It gives rise to lifelong relationships of intimacy and generativity, grounding the ordinary time of family and community. It is also in the intimacy of family life that gender complexity sometimes emerges in wonderful variety. A dad might walk the hallways with a crying baby night after night. Mom might model leadership and decisiveness for young adult children. We play with these models at home. Yet these same family dynamics have, in other cases, calcified in rigidity, crushing personal growth and insight, closing off human potential, and generating patterns of emotional and physical abuse. I swim in this culture too, we all do. That's why I can make a joke about mom and sheet cake, and you get it. We have a shared frame of reference. I'd like to begin the slideshow now. But you may also know that many of these traditional norms are recent cultural accretions. You may know that pink and blue are fairly new color coding for girls and boys, for example. What is more significant is that the social norms about females and males, indeed the understanding of what an adult human is, has been and continues to be deeply influenced by human culture. It is different from place to place and from era to era. Transgender persons who have a real and deep-seated sense that the gender they were assigned at birth is wrong, and gay and lesbian persons with the same sex orientation are not standing outside the culture. Rather, they are thinking about the integrity of their lives and seeking wholeness from precisely where they stand within it. The same is true for heterosexual persons, as well as those who find coherence between their identity and the gender they are assigned at birth. We all share this culture. Slide. And this culture is not static, it is on the move. Even over just the past 50 years since the Second Vatican Council, norms about male and female have shifted. In the broader culture in the US, the openings for women's growth brought on by women's liberation, and in some way, the emergence of safe contraceptive options have allowed women to advance in public life. While the church has supported this advance, for example, the texts of Vatican II support women working and serving in professional life. When this newfound authority led women to seek ordination to the priesthood in the 70s and 80s, the response was to double down on normative roles for women. In the letter to women assigned in 1995 for the UN Conference on Women in Beijing, John Paul II called for women to be fully integrated into social, political, and economic life. Yet, while he argued that women will increasingly play a part in the solution to these problems, he also saw their contribution as a gendered one. Women would push back against a social order that was organized on efficiency and would favor the humanization which marks the civilization of love. Here we can hear not a liberal feminism, but a gender feminism. Women would be able to do this, John Paul Opine, because of their distinctive female psychosexual identity an elaboration of which became no, known as a new Catholic feminism, a new feminism to contrast with the old feminism of liberal struggle. This new feminism was the new clothes that put a forward looking face on a retrenchment to church authority for women and lay people, pushing back against some of the movements forward for women that began in the spirit of Vatican II. Around this retrenchment grew up a traditionalist turn for significant pockets of Catholic liturgical and devotional practice. Those continue today. Touchstones for Catholic orthodoxy have increasingly narrowed to focus on a rejection of artificial contraception, a rejection of abortion, and a rejection of the possibility of the ordination of women. Themes repeated so much that this trio could easily eclipse God's own triunity in the Catholic mind as central to the faith. This traditionalist turn is to a large degree, I believe, a reaction to the liberalization of gender norms and roles. While same-sex attraction and gender crossing has always been part of the human experience, the more recent sense that people have a right to live publicly as they choose has, particularly with the case of transgender persons, been a powerful challenge to the structure of norms, which understands itself to be predicated on the theology of creation. 
As the recognition that human sexual and gender diversity is often demonized in our culture becomes clear, policy and legislation has been reenacted to protect the marginalized. Slide. The Catholic Church's most recent response to these policies in a text from the Congregation on Catholic Education, so school policy is the focus here, has been to affirm the worth and dignity of all, but to reject any policies that seem to approve or normalize forms of gender theory that deny the difference and reciprocity and nature of a man and a woman. This document does recognize the distinction between sex and gender, the problem lies in this document's mind in the separation of sex from gender that allows for individual choice. Breaking this linkage between sex and gender destroys in the mind of this document the integrity of both male and female, as these should be understood, it holds, in a complementary fashion, ordered one to the other. And only in this ordering is male or female identity authentic and appropriately heterosexual. In fact, in this final quote, in the use of radically autonomous, you can hear the charge that same-sex attraction is fundamentally selfish. In contrast, the critical essentialism I propose recognizes that male and female are different, but it also suggests that the theology of complementarity has truncated the full exploration of these two constellations of biological characteristics. This critical essentialism argues that this biological binary does not consist of two separate locked rooms. On the contrary, it has always been true that male and female have been lived as human dual realities with many elements of a biological continuum between. Thus, this critical essentialism, besides its claim that we do not have access to an understanding of male and female that is not inflected by culture, also questions the norm that what is most distinctive about sexual difference is its orientation to the other. Slide. To summarize the above, here I'm just summarizing about what a critical essentialism means. First, it agrees with gender scholarship that our understanding of this difference has been shaped by culture and thus by social understandings of power and pollution and borders. We have no access to male and female that is not always already processed through an interpretive lens. Having said this, our access to male and female is always filtered. This doesn't mean it is fallen in some way as if there's some primordial state of pure male or female that is our goal. Catholics claim that God is with us in and through the created world. Against Gnosticism, we hold that material reality really can and does mediate the divine. Thus, we should not scorn that we have cultural norms for gender, God works through history, of course, but we should relentlessly interrogate them, allowing the God who works through history to continue that work in us. Also, while claiming that sexual difference is linked to creation in a way that is not true for other kinds of difference, this uh, critical essentialism does recognize that our experience of gender is intersectional, without remainder. It is always filtered through multiple lenses of class and race. Sexual differences I hold more fundamental than other forms of difference, but it is part of culture as a gender construct. And in this, it is not necessarily more important or even more decisive for personal identity than our other markers, such as ability, race, or class. Slide. An anthropological constant male-female union as the basis for reproduction. This is the second point. Compl contemporary discussions of gender difference often dismiss the role of sexual intercourse in the creation of human beings, particularly among those like my progressive friends who are arguing for more expansive understandings of gender, sex, and sexuality. It is striking that procreation is often left out of the conversation, given that literature's emphasis on embodiment. For some reason, the role of male and female in reproduction is brushed aside as mere biology, somehow beneath the consideration of academic theory. On the other hand, Catholic moral theology has rightly been criticized as overemphasizing that, as being overact-centered and instrumentalist. 
while recognizing that the good of sexual intercourse is both procreative and unitive in the official Catholic story, the legal weight of the arguments has have too often rested on the procreative side, parsing in excruciating details the limits of the sexual acts in question with little moral attention given to the relational aspect. In this official conversation, the understanding that sexual intercourse is also good because it, inter it nurtures the relationship of the two is not ignored, texts like Amoris Laetitiae do engage the full ga gamut of challenges to family life, from the struggle with work and economic realities, to the situations of families in refugee camps, to the need for patience and honesty in the crises that arise over the course of family life, and to the need for parents to recognize that they do not own their children, but must recognize their own human dignity. These, like the need for sexual intimacy, are dealt with, however, as pastoral issues. Often the advice is good, but they are rarely, except in cases of abuse, a matter for legislation the procreative element is often legislated. Contrasting with this, current discussion among progressive Christians seems to ignore procreation and simply talk about relational goods. With the goal of naming the good therefore in same-sex relationships, Catholic progressives focus almost exclusively on the quality of the relationship bond as a similar unitive good and the generosity of the couple as demonstrated in their openness to care for children, perhaps adopted, as well as their support for extended families or communities. Even in progressive discussions about sexual ethics that focus on heterosexual relationships, babies often seem to be a random byproduct. They happen sometimes. Of course, pregnancy is not always the outcome of heterosexual activity. It is absolutely true that most heterosexual sexual acts while they may be unitive, they bind couples together relationally, are not procreative. It is also true that a percentage of those that may initially be procreative do not result in live births. Miscarriage is in fact fairly common. Nevertheless, there is a forgetfulness here, a reflexive emphasis on what a person does or feels, but our existence itself escapes our gaze as the significance of male-female bodily difference is waved away in discussions of gender difference or sexual orientation with lines like, uh, reproduction of course remains an issue. In a recent issue of Common Wheel magazine, Daniel Walden argues that sex and gender talk is nonsense and that in seeking to understand the term sex and gender then, we need to start elsewhere at the beginning by which I mean their first application to us shortly after we're born. Uh, this author's goal, which is achieved admirably in his essay, is to unpack the thoroughness with which our sense of ourselves as gendered is constructed. I agree. But the impact of sex on the human person does not have its beginning at birth. Male-female union of some kind is the condition for the possibility of that birth. It is rather remarkable that the conception of children is passed over in a literature that is otherwise hyper-aware about sex and gender. Slide. To be clear, particularly recently, theologians have begun to incorporate their own experience of parenthood, sometimes simply to be transparent about their own multiple identities, sometimes as a specific point of theological reflection. There is an emerging body of scholarship on motherhood and fatherhood done by theologians with children, as well as reflections on infertility and gender. But my focus is on the condition for the possibility of theologizing about parenting or anything else. So I would like to turn our attention to the possibility of human life itself. Slide. I use the term anthropological constant to refer to the idea that all individual human beings are expressions of some kind of male-female union. In using this term, I'm referring to the work of Edvard Skilibex, who, with phrasing that positions the immediate segue between biology and the social construction of the person, argues, articulates several coordinates or constants for theological anthropology. Skilibex names the first of these constants, the importance of a relationship to human corporeality, nature, and the ecological environment. He concludes that man is a body but also has one. While gender was not immediately on his mind, Skilibex importantly recognized that Catholic theology had a biological and act-centered ethic. 
That was a problem. He felt it did not adequately account for the fullness of human life and relationality. In this observation, he was quite right. His concern in developing an adequate anthropological perspective was with views of man and culture, more specifically, personal identity within social culture. This pattern for the consideration of theological anthropology attracted the attention of a group of feminist theologians who found in this work a good starting point, point for engaging these gendered constructions. I would also like to bring forward, however, that he first acknowledges that the human person both is and also has a body. These bodies are due to a more fundamental anthropological constant, I suggest, that the body a human person is and has is the result of some kind of male-female union. This is what we forget. There's another forgetting in this conversation about reproduction. Most people, while they are the result of some kind of male-female union, are not the product of a Catholic sacramental marriage. For that matter, that male-female union that produces persons who may become Catholic or something else could be outside of marriage completely. It may not be between persons who name their sexual orientation as heterosexual. It may take place in a casual encounter. It could even be an act of abuse. This union may be assisted or it could be in a test tube. Nevertheless, Catholics regard all people as infinitely valuable, as made in the image of God. I need to remind us the, that the incidence of your conception does not alter this value. So this is a very basic, fundamental anthropological point. Whatever privilege one might attach to the role of male-female union for reproduction as an anthropological constant, it does not then, that privilege, accrue to hetero heterosexual persons or relationships simply as heterosexual persons or relationships. That's the living out of that human life. Slide. All kinds of persons may emerge from male-female union. The persons who result from this reproduction will each be a person of infinite dignity and worth. They will grow into their own integrity their own appropriation of their biological sex, which they learn from their social context as a narrative about gender that they receive and revise. Their own affective selves may be queer or bisexual or drawn to males or females, but that anthropological constant remains. It does not, however, predict human growth and development. It does not control it. To summarize the above, my point here is that it is disingenuous to argue for expansive understandings of human sexuality without acknowledging the role of heterosexual union in a really limited sense in the creation of human persons. Those created persons, each of whom has an intrinsic worth and dignity, will grow into their own sexual and affective maturity. Statistically, most of these will live some version of the binary male and female, their narrative filtered from the beginning through the cultural narrative of the gender assigned to them at birth based on their biological st characteristics. Statistically, most of these will have a heterosexual orientation. These two groups actually do not necessarily map directly onto one another. In addition, a significant minority of human persons also map onto this mosaic, non-binary, gay or lesbian, transsexual or intersexual or queer, each of whom has an intrinsic worth and dignity, each of whom grow into their own sexual and affective maturity. Out of all the people in this mosaic, a significant set of male-female pairs will produce the next generation. This is the anthropological constant, that each human life emerges from some kind of male-female union, whether via sexual intercourse or laboratory-assisted re reproduction. If we are going to value each human life in all the variety it may take, this needs to be asserted. But it is an assertion about human origins, not a normative description for behavior. Stepping away from that description, I suggest, could allow us to reconsider anew the place of this constant in our consideration of the human person. Let me be clear, the Catholic narrative about gender and sex and marriage and family has much value. But when we look at the actual complexity of human reproduction as it maps onto this narrative, we see that there are many 
life-giving patterns, even in scripture. This too invites us to reconsider anew the place of this constant in our consideration of the human person. It might also cause us to think again about how we set Catholic marriage itself in the generational life of peoples and cultures, as these carry the human rhythm of family and community into the future. So what is my point in these two proposals? The suggestion that sex and gender be understood with the background framework of a critical essentialism, and the suggestion that the role of male and female in reproduction be understood as an anthropological constant. My point is this, to suggest that the urgent task for Catholic theologies that focus on sex and gender, particularly those of us who seek to broaden the lens of care and dignity, need to engage more directly with these two issues in our constructive work. First, we need to think more broadly about the terms male and female outside the framework of complementarity. And then we need to ask how to situate the place of male and female union in reproduction. In other words, I suggest that we ignore, uh, rather that we resituate male and female in Catholic thought. We need to lower the symbolic temperature at the same time that we soberly think again about how this difference is not only significant for human life, but to what extent, if any, it is significative. Does it have any role in terms of norms that value the breadth of the human family? Slide. We have assumed that we knew what it meant to refer to male and female, to heterosexual intercourse and Catholic thought. We understand scholarship that has critiqued gendered norms for human life and also has unpacked the way in which heterosexuality, as we understand this today, is a product of a particular culture and time. Theologically, however, these critiques have yet to grapple in a pastorally significant way with the challenge that gender theory presents to the Catholic story. To be fair, the sometimes overwrought language and strained metaphors of newer traditionalist approaches seem to me to be positive intent as they clearly feel the need to think aloud, somewhat defensively, about the categories of male and female, as well as to think about the status of norms for pastoral practice. But we can also see the silence about these categories, which I've criticized here. The silence about these in more progressive circles might be a silence that is simply being careful. And I get this. It is a silence that is appropriately chastened, appropriately concerned not to put forward a narrative about male and female that could do further harm. Aware as we are that given the preferential option, the first task for Catholics is to invite those already harmed and marginalized, gay and lesbian persons, trans men and trans women, those who are bisexual or intersex or queer, to let them speak for themselves about their own experience. Those who understand themselves with the gender they were assigned at birth, whose orientation is heterosexual, they need to be heard too, as they find much more latitude in the categories male and female, without the need to define themselves only in the terms set by binary complementarity. In these discussions, it also helps to name a few assumptions that come into play as soon as we open the door to speaking about gender and sex. First, there is an almost inescapable assumption that mention of this topic always comes packaged with a normal, a moralizing narrative. If I say, let's talk about Catholicism and sex, all you can hear is, and you're doing it wrong. People often think that the only reason to talk about gender and sexual orientation in Catholic thought is to judge who's in and who's out. It is extremely hard to bracket this assumption. And second, there's a cultural response, sometimes kind of reactionary, to movements and insights that challenge the usual narrative. This is the back and fill action of a border patrol. We have a term in theology, lex orandi lex credendi. It's used in many contexts, but the point is that our prayers should shape our theology. Sometimes when we're worried about uh, guarding our borders, we start with the rules and the norms, and then we work back and shape our theology to fit that. That's a problem. What we need to do instead is to un you know, unveil to some extent the revelation we want to engage and let that and human experience speak to us. Slide, please. Into this atmosphere, we have the recent Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's response. 
that no, same-sex relationships may not be blessed by the church. You might have read about this in the news. The response here both escalates the difference between heterosexual and same-sex relationship, and it insists on treating the question of this blessing in a legalistic way. So a few observations. First, some people have observed that the statement has positive things to say about same-sex persons and even same-sex relationships. But in fact, the positive language about some same-sex unions is in fact quite fragile. Here I see this quotation that even the positive elements which are valued and appreciated cannot justify these relationships and the positive elements exist within the context of a union not ordered to the creator's plan. So it's the positive element is really played down in fact. Some have claimed that this text is not unjust discrimination because such a blessing could be refused to any unmarried sexual activity, all of which is condemned by the church. But it is clear in the language of this dubium that the blessing of these unions in particular are rejected because they find that such a blessing would constitute a certain imitation or analog of the nuptial blessing invoked on man and woman in the sacrament of matrimony. And in fact, the text says, uh, same-sex union is not in any way remotely analogous to this. And so it, it sort of doubles down on bifurcating these two. The CDF can claim no unjust discrimination in public policy, simply saying that the withholding of the blessing is about the withholding of approval for sex outside of marriage. But Father Jim Martin, who has written extensively about the need for the church to engage the LGBT community more positively, has pointed out that the only teachers at Catholic schools who get fired are those who marry their same-sex partner, not those whose relationships are irregular in other ways. Slide. These are very resonant quotes. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk about walls and bridges. That's why we show a, a wall here that is being built, the shovels standing by. A wall that protects the integrity of an institution like the church is not a shiny, impenetrable modern monolith. Reflecting the integral ecology of Pope Francis, the wall is organic. It is made of materials that are part of the surrounding landscape. Deer or cows or even sheep might regularly climb over the wall at a certain place, and it may give way, reshaping the path of that border. A nearby bridge, rejecting a model that would place a shining highway suspended triumphantly over history, might have a similar integrity built of the same local stone and mud. Slide. Pulling the camera back a little now, I must acknowledge that the church's fundamentally conservative approach does have value, thus these old walls, particularly in the face of rapidly changing cultural horizons. There is reason for the church to treasure its central religious insight that God comes to us through the world. That world is real, its nature and action are discoverable by human knowledge. This knowledge is continually rethought and revised. It is done in a community, that has a tradition of both wisdom and free inquiry. This is a living tradition. It builds on and critiques earlier observations, earlier measurements, earlier cultural assumptions. Slide. At the same time, the Catholic faith receives this world not only as real, but as creation. It is given by God. You do not need to deny the mechanisms of those disciplines that study the natural world to claim in faith that our lives and the world around us are created, are given to us. We do not create ourselves. It is this claim of faith that I gesture toward when I suggest the term critical essentialism as a way to position the duality of male and female as an always elusive touchstone for theological anthropology's discussion of sex and gender. It is also this claim of faith that I gesture toward when I suggest that we position the role of heterosexual intercourse in the ongoing generations of human life as an anthropological constant. In the second century, Irenaeus of Lyon insisted that the Catholic faith should be lived in continuity with history and across cultures, finding this expansiveness to be theological, theologically necessary for the church's vision and integrity. Catholicism plays for keeps. 
It plays for the long term. It plays for the global church. The church doesn't do strategic, playing one good off another. Instead, it understands itself as committed to the truth, committed to the world. I constantly remind my students that Catholic Christianity is a historically normative tradition. We hold that the event of Jesus Christ mattered and is decisive for history. And that this commitment to an ongoing rooted tradition means that theology is inherently conservative. It lags the latest insights, although sometimes it seems just reactionary. In fact, as Jesuit John O'Malley reminds us, most reform movements in the church have been met not with Catholic insights, but with roadblocks, authoritarian statements, silence, and excommunication threats. We see this in some of the church's responses to questions about sexuality and gender over the last 70 years. Responses that have often escalated differences and then reached for legalistic solutions. To the extent that these responses are merely reactionary, they should not be the last word. Slide. A different kind of Catholic thinking is on display in Pope Francis's text, Laudato Si, the 2015 text that urges us to better care for our common home. In this text, we hear Francis's broader vision for an integral ecology, an approach that situates questions about the human person in a much broader context than do those texts from the Congregations for Catholic Education or on doctrine although these texts are also part of the Francis papacy. Those education and CDF texts are focused on a problem. They need to resolve a specific situation now, and they do so within the envelope of how these questions have always been framed. This approach, even with a sort of pastoral tone, is simply inadequate for issues of human rights and human dignity, issues we now face. Laudato Si tells us there is another way for the church to accompany the world's peoples in history. This approach, which draws more on the style of a public Urbi at Orbi address than an inward looking encyclical, reframes the task of the church in a human centered manner that might serve as a way forward that could integrate the odd extra and the odd intra face of the church. Recognizing that male-female union gives birth to generations of human beauty and variety, rather than beginning these questions with norms about marriage and gender and family life. Slide. So here we have a bridge. In the Laudato Si approach first, Pope Francis makes it clear that he intends to address the human family as a whole, that his goal is a deep story of human flourishing. Rather than ever more vigilant border control, Francis intends to propose the vision of care for humanity and care for the earth in a way that will build bridges and not walls. Second, Pope Francis leverages the theology of creation against any tendency to fracture the human family. He questions the implicit anthropocentrism of modern thought, which of course fractures creation by setting the human against it. In short, he poses an integral ecology that does not exhort humans to care for the natural world as divinely commissioned overlords driven by self-interest, imposing those shiny walls and suspended bridges over everything without consumer value. Rather, he presents an integral ecology in which humanity stands in solidarity, even with the non-human world, precisely as created. And finally, Laudato Si brings the quiet confidence of faith to the urgency of the world's brokenness a faith that does not shirk the pain that stands before it. This faith is unsparing in its analysis of human failure and humble about the place of the church as it reaches out as a companion to a broken world. We have talked tonight about the way in that gender is culturally constructed, which also means that it too is a product of history. Like the church, our cultural norms about sex and gender change over time. This change does not stop with today, as if to say now we are at the apex of human insight. Our understanding about sex and gender will be different in five years, and it will be different in 50 years. We need to be a little humble, therefore, about our insights, willing to see our own appropriation of the tradition as always provisional, part of a larger trajectory. Our job is to cooperate with the grace that we trust is guiding the way. I am happy to hear any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Dalavali, for that wonderful and um, thought-provoking talk. I'd like to invite our audience who's watching on YouTube that if they have any uh, questions for Dr. Dalavali, to please put them in the YouTube chat, and um, I'll try my best to pass them all on to her. Um, just to give people time um, you know, to type up some questions and think a little bit, um, Dr. Dalavali, I wanted to ask you a bit about this. You brought this up at the beginning of your talk, and you kind of weaved it throughout and you really brought it back um, with the CDF document, this this whole idea of Pope Francis on one hand uh, espousing this new openness and then on the other hand allowing the CDF document, which, you know, and you could say, well, it's nothing really new in the sense that this it's not a surprise that he that the CDF said no in the dubium to blessing same sex um, relationships or marriages, excuse me. Um, but I'm just wondering, how do you kind of think through that tension right now um, at the, in, in the Vatican? What, what were you surprised by the CDF's document, or, or, or is this a pattern that you've just been seeing? I mean, just how do you think through this tension? Oh, good, good question. Um, you know, in politics, they say that you uh, you campaign in poetry, but you have to govern in prose, right? And so, you know, when I see something like the CDF text, it, mostly I just, I wish they didn't feel the need to issue a dubium because once that happens, you're in a legalistic framework and you need to answer. You're, it's, it's like you're the Supreme Court and you have to answer in a way that is coherent with the narrative that you're uh, dealing with right then. Uh, and Pope Francis does both. Pr Pope Francis is both, you know, campaigning for a new vision for the church and he campaigns in poetry. Mm -hmm. And he is also the chief executive of the church and he is doing that in prose. And so at some point he felt that, uh, or, or the CDF did and convinced him that he needed to say something or at least to approve of them saying something about these blessings and whether or not they will be acceptable. And so I see both things going on uh, in the pontificate of Pope Francis. Um, and in fact, I think, uh, you know, God willing, Pope Francis lives for a, a long, long time. Um, but I think that we will probably see this as uh, sort of pinballing back and forth for some time to come in the church because moving out of the church as an institution of norms and laws and into some kind of vision of the church as more, more directly governed as with, with the sense of a pilgrim people on the way to the future is going to be a push and pull for some time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that. I, we have a question from Catherine Harbertson. She asked, if the Catholic God is genderless, why does Catholic teaching not accept non-binary people? Okay, uh, great question. Um, so the, you know, you're 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 quite right that God has no gender. We have all these different uh, images that we use to speak about revelation, to speak about how we have experienced the presence of God. The majority of those that are played tend to be masculine images, but it's clear that there have been feminine images to interpret that experience of God since the beginning, right? Um, so why then do we think of human persons as gendered male and female, and not as made in the image of God, that humanity itself is made in the image of God? That's a good question. Uh, what I wanna put forward without ruling out the possibility that some human persons grow into maturity, understanding themselves as standing outside the gender binary, that the fact that human persons are created by some kind of male-female union continues to be a piece, just a, piece, a starting point for every single person that exists, even persons who come to see the fullness of who they are as being non-binary or asexual, that's, a, that's another option. Or they may say that they are intersex, either they say that because that corresponds to a biological 
anatomy or that simply is how they describe their appropriation of this constant. What I would also say though, is that we have, we have no sort of direct access to whatever male and female might be that isn't filtered through culture. And that is important to keep our finger on even as we also keep our finger on the fact that God has no gender. That's the orientation of the human person. We are not divine, we are created, and we are created in order to create future generations. Just to kind of follow up on that a little bit, I know that Please you have do. some students who are um, joining us tonight from um, a class I, that I believe you mentioned was on gender and Catholic thought. I think you said that was yeah. the class, mm -hmm. course topic. And um, this, in fact, you even quoted a, a document that has this in the title, Male and Female, He Created Them, um, which for a lot of Catholics and a lot of Christians in general, that is where, that, that's sort of the, the proof text for complementarity. Um, how do you how do you teach that? What kind of conversations do you get into with your students and and, and just the material um, surrounding that that very key uh, biblical passage? Um, we we do we do discuss this actually. We haven't unpacked that the the what I would consider the heart of that creation text uh, as directly as you're asking. So I'd like to say something about that. Um, I simply want you to note that you know, male and female, he created them is part of scripture. So, so are a lot of things. We, we, we also don't have uh, access to scripture that someone hasn't read before and interpreted uh, for us that comes to us with, so, so this, this text sort of leaps out off the page in glowing letters and other passages just sort of are there. The other thing though, is that this passage does not say and he created them, you know, in such a way that neither of them were full human persons. It, that it doesn't say that. So the, the idea that complementarity, especially in the super zero sum way that it is uh, articulated today, is not necessarily part of that creation story. It simply observes, you know, the creation stories are an are an early group of people reflecting on how we got here. And it simply observes that from the beginning, we have seen that human persons are male and female. That must be how God created humanity. And the superstructure that we have built on that is a superstructure that we have built on it. And more recently, we have begun, because of questions raised by gender theory, to double down on making male and female very dependent on one another. And it always it hasn't always been seen like that. So I, sim I simply want to say that the existence of humanity as male and female does not imply complementarity, particularly the way that it is currently articulated. Um, we, have, we have some great other, other great questions coming in. Um, one person asks, Thanks for this great talk. I'm struck by the images in your slides. Could you say more about the way beauty and creation or beautiful varieties and our human attraction play into your thinking? Um, well, because I only had a few minutes tonight, um, <laughs> I, uh, I was able only to kind of gesture toward, but I'm, I'm very influenced. And of course, all Catholic feminist theologians are by the work of Elizabeth Johnson, who's going to be speaking on uh, this lecture series later. Um, for heaven's sakes, if you're short on time, turn me off and save your time to listen to Elizabeth Johnson. She's terrific. Um, but she did a wonderful book on Darwin and evolution, where she her she quotes this famous passage from The Origin of the Species about the tangled bank to speak about creation and all its variety. And so I I, I was I was thinking of that as I wanted to emphasize that this assertion that male-female union is necessary for reproduction, for human generations, evolution, that it does not govern the tangled bank, the, the manyness, beauty, and variety that is uh, human life, and particular, uh, our experience of ourselves as uh, gendered, 
and the play with that gender that people are currently doing more publicly than they did before. It's mm -hmm. certain it is we have we have uh, evidence that there is the experience of uh, ex finding oneself to be transgender, mm -hmm. uh, of being certainly of homosexual orientation from ver the earliest layers of human experience as recorded. We also recognize that because all of our gender experience is constructed, we can't actually map what we would now call same sex attraction on earlier records that sound like saying there was there's that had its own cultural integrity in the same way that all of my experience of being a heterosexual woman is is like is like now and not necessarily like um earlier ages yeah that's great that's wonderful thank you for that um catherine um harbinson asked uh does the fact uh, excuse me i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I skipped a person by accident because the chat moved a little bit. Um, Emily Kara asked, you mentioned that the wall protecting the church is made from the world around it. Why is this important? Does this provide a camouflage effect for this wall blending in with what is outside of it? Well, if it's supposed to be for camouflage, it's not doing a very good job. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think I turn to this the the image of this wall because I see the church, as I mentioned earlier, with Francis, as sometimes almost in a little bit of a panic, throwing up norms, throwing up roadblocks, uh, hoping to ward off um, the onrush of human insight about the human person, and. Um, what I meant by the use of these walls was simply that if if you're building a totally impermeable wall, you are building what I would call a modern structure that is propositional and linear and rational. And that has never been the way that theology or the church's understanding of its own tradition has proceeded. It has always been sort of unfolding. It is organic. One thing is connected to what is before it. And there are often sort of odd ends here and there. There are often places in the wall where, um, you know, as I said, someone might have jumped over enough times and after a while you get a little dip in the wall. And then we have, we have a norm, but we have a pastoral application that says that this norm can also be understood in this somewhat more attenuated sense in this case. And so this is how the church has proceeded. It is not contrary to the impression you may have from some contemporary conversation. It's not like it's not like a clearly run organization with all of the buttons nailed down. It is much more sort of a large cathedral with you know, side altars that no one's been to for years, but they're still here. And sometimes people come in just to sleep in the pews for a little while, and then they kind of wander on their way. There's just, it's its a much more complex living organic kind of edifice than simply a legal uh, structure. And I th think that means also then that it has an inner integrity and inter an inner elasticity that will allow it if it sort of lets go of some of the, the its uh, legalisms to move forward with the human person and become a genuine force for the human family going forward, which I think is really important. That's a beautiful image of the cathedral you just brought up there. Um, there's a, a Catherine Harbinson has a, has a question that I, I, if somebody asked me this in class, I'm not sure what I would say on the spot. So I'm hoping you can do a oh, better job. I, I could do. Um, does the fact that Jesus was not made for male-female unions say anything about male-female unions? Uh, it, now, so isn't that an interesting question? We, um, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we do tend in Catholic thought to just to add gender whenever it suits us and to elide it whenever it does not. And so uh, 
Catholic theology uh, understands that Jesus of Nazareth is the product of uh, God's favor upon the Blessed Virgin. So there is a human mother involved. And then there is mm, something else that makes a fully human, fully divine person. Um, what does that, you know, in you might ask yourself, you know, if that is the incarnation, guys, what are we going to do with you? <laughs> we could ask it that way. <laughs> I could put you on the spot, Professor Little. Uh, and so th that that is a question, unless you're going to say, of course, that, well, God's a male. And um, and that just, we don't, we don't actually uh, hold that, even though some mothers might feel that way about their adult sons. I want to take moderator privilege on that one and um, uh, just <laughs> <laughs> move the conversation to another question. Um, just one last question, actually, just to wrap up the evening. Um, Dr. Delavalle. First of all, thank you so much for this. But um, I just wanted to know, just as a general final question, where do you think we're going to go from here? You mentioned those roadblocks. You mentioned that, John, you know, as John O'Malley said, there's always these roadblocks through any reform movement in the church. I mean, where where do you see us at least in the, sh I mean, you can't predict the complete future, but at least in the short term, where do you think you see this conversation going? I would rather think about the long term because uh, the short term, I think, may actually be uh, a little rocky. I think I, um, I don't see a good way, a good way forward other than more sort of um, increasingly contortionist legal uh, responses to genuine questions that the church just isn't quite ready to unpack yet. I do hope that in the short term, we can keep sort of dubium type pronouncements to a minimum so that we don't have to go back and overturn ourselves, which the church does not like to do. Um, I do also see, however, there is a lot of momentum. Uh, this, this dubium itself about blessing same-sex relationships, same-sex marriages, allowing those that are civilly married to have some kind of, just some kind of inclusion in church life. There is a lot of pushback against this and it's very careful. It simply is focusing on the good of relationships. And I think that might get somewhere and it might be like that stone wall where we pull back a little bit on further pronouncements and allow for some pastoral applications to take root in what is actually in the end, a fairly decentered church that does often respond generously to the people for whom it has care. Thank you so much. Thank you for those thoughts and um, thank you for those rich insights and, and uh, just joining us here tonight and for our speaker series. Um, I also like to thank all our viewers um, and um, as, Dr. Vali, Vali mentioned we have another speaker, our last one for the semester, um, Elizabeth Johnson, who will be speaking, um, I believe, also at 7 o'clock uh, a week from now, also Wednesday of next week. So thank you all, and have a wonderful evening. For joining tonight's program, to learn more, visit sacredheart.edu.